Ready to roll? All right. Good morning. Good morning, and welcome to Connection Free Will Baptist Church. So glad to have all of you here this morning. If you would, start making your way to, to your seats, and uh, you'll want to be standing for this first song. We're going to sing, I'll Fly Away. Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away to a home on God's left your shore. I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away when I die. Hallelujah. By and by, I'll fly away when the shadows of this life have gone. I'll fly away like a bird from prison bars that's flown. I'll fly away, I'll fly away. Oh, glory! I'll fly away. I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away. To a land where joy shall never end, I'll fly away. Hallelujah! I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. One more time. Oh, I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Amen. I can't wait. Y'all be seated. I cannot wait that glorious day. Just a few days. The song says a few more weary days, a few more happy days, and I'll fly away. I'll tell you what, before I get started any further, I... I was at work the other night, having a pretty good, I call it morning when I start work at four in the afternoon, it's morning. I was outside getting ready to dump some cardboard out and everything else and got to thinking about this and do y'all know what the word epiphany means? It's looking at something natural and God giving you a supernatural insight into something. You know how I always say, well I can't wait to go back to, and you mentioned the home you're from. I can't wait to get back to Oklahoma and see, you know, go back to Oshalade, Oklahoma. Or somebody might say West Virginia. Some might say out, you know, back home to the country. Or it's not the place you're longing for, but it's the people that are there you're hoping to see. You can't wait to see. So my hope is in the Lord. So that longing I have to go to heaven ain't to see a pearly gate, ain't to see streets of gold, it ain't to see the crystal sea, it ain't to see any of that, but it's to see my Jesus. That's my longing because he said he knew me before time. I've always been with him somehow. Now I want to return to see him again. So that's the longing we have in our hearts to go home. It's not to see dirt, buildings, or houses or anything. It's to see the people we love. So anyway, just a thought. And I won't even charge you for that one. So let's go to the Lord in prayer real quick before we got to do that, though. Um, uh, uh, something I wanted to announce first, but I can't remember what it was. Yeah, the coat drive. Let's not forget our coat drive. Uh, but before we go to the Lord in prayer, I'm going to ask a dear sister. She asked if, uh, if the church would keep her in prayer. And if I could get the men, elders of the church to come forward. Sister, if you want to come forward. And it says, if any of you request prayer or need prayer, to come before the church and ask the elders to pray, one for another, in the laying on of hands. Here, I'll let you, if you want to use some. And it's not in the oil. It's not 
the oil. Right. It's not the man Amen. that stands here. It's not the people that pray Love. over. But it's the faith. The woman with the issue of the blood, all she knew she had to do was to reach out and touch Jesus' garment. That was her faith that healed her. And Jesus said, by thy faith, they have, you have been made whole. So it's by faith, sister, that you've asked for prayer. Yes. And it's by faith you can be made whole. Yes, I will. Whole means not feeling better. Whole means put back to where your state was before. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. My Heavenly Father, I thank you again for the chance to come before your throne and to bring my sister before you, dear God, as we lift her up, Lord. She says that she's hurting. She's asked for prayer, Lord. And we're just claiming your promise that you've given to us. We thank you again, Lord, for that promise, Lord, we claim. We ask that your hand be upon this sister. As this day, Lord, we ask that the healing be started in her body and in her life. Lord, I ask that her faith be made strong and she be made whole in this, dear God. Lord, I pray that if there be others, Lord, that need healing and need help, Lord, that they'll see, seek you out first and your riches, and your righteousness, Lord, and that, the, that, that it'll be added unto them. Lord, we ask you now that you'll be with my sister, Lord, and she prays, and strengthen her faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. Love you, sister. Lord, thank you. Thank you. One of the greatest things that somebody can do is come to you and ask you for prayer. <laughs> Hallelujah. Our greatest weapon we can fight that God left us when he went to be with the, at the right hand of the Father, when Jesus left us that day of ascension, was the spirit he put inside of us. He said he had to go so that the comforter can come. He could only be with us in the flesh while he was here. He could only be in certain places. He was flesh and blood like you and I. He said he had to go so that the Holy Spirit could come and dwell within us. And that's what he left for us. We can reach a lot more people than we can with a man in a pair of sandals walking around the desert. And I kind of paraphrase that as another preacher said, that Jesus could only do what he could see. But now that the Holy Spirit's in us, anywhere, anytime, God is omnipotent. He knows all, sees all, does all, be anywhere at all times. That's my Jesus, and that's, that's who we pray for. And what he gave us before he left was prayer, to pray for one another. And that's what we'll do. Anything else? No. Really? I know we've had one birthday this past month. Oh, we had a birthday. Oh. Oh, yes, sister. Yes. Okay, we will. Let's do that real quick. Anybody else have any special prayer requests? We'll just cover these right now. Okay. Amen. Anybody? Yes. <laughs> Rick King. <laughs> Let's keep him in prayer. <laughs> Please play for Rick. <laughs> Any other prayer requests? Several. Yeah. Yes. I want to thank you all for mending and taking care of things and seeing things through when I'm not here. I'm so grateful. Uh, I want. I want to. I haven't had a chance to do this. I want to thank the Smith family from not Friday, but Friday before opening their home to us. Had a great time. Yes. I want to say thank you. Any other prayer requests? 
If not, Brother Gary King, would you lead us in prayer for these? Birthdays? Do we have any birthdays this past week? <laughs> That's almost a setup, wasn't it? <laughs> Anybody else have a birthday this past week that they want to admit to? <laughs> I'm going to throw that out there now. <laughs> Brother Rick, would you mind standing, please? You ain't going to think I'm going to have everybody stand, do you? <laughs> I can get you to stand. Brother, happy people. birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, God bless you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, <laughs> Brother Kevin. All right, you may remain seated, we're going to sing a couple more songs here before I turn over to Brother Gary, we're going to sing, it is joy unspeakable. I have found his grace is all complete, he supplieth every need. While I sit and learn at Jesus' feet, I am free as free indeed. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Oh, the half has never yet been told. I have found the pleasure I once craved. It is joy and peace within. What a wondrous blessing I am saved from the awful gulf of sin. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, oh, the half has never yet been told. I have found that hope so bright and clear, living in the realm of grace. Oh, the Savior's presence is so near, I can see his smiling face. And it is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, oh, the half has never yet been told. I have found the joy no tongue can tell, how its waves of glory roll. It is like a great o'erflowing well springing up within my soul. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, oh, the half has never yet been told. Amen. Amen. Sing one more here. Uh, I haven't sung this one in years. In my heart, there rings a melody. My dad always used to sing this one growing up, so as soon as I saw this, I was like, this is a good classic. Mm -hmm. 
I have a song that Jesus gave me. Uh, it was sent from heaven above. There never was a sweeter melody. Tis a melody of love. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody with heaven's harmony. And in my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of love. I love the Christ who died on Calvary, for he washed my sins away. He built within my heart a melody, and I know it's there to stay. And in my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of love. Will be my endless theme in glory. With the angels I will sing. It will be a song with glorious harmony when the courts of heaven ring. And in my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of love. Amen. Amen. Well, that has been a long time. <laughs> For special music this morning, I'm going to sing a song. I couldn't find this in the, in the Free Will Baptist hymnal, but this was a, a song a friend of my dad's had um, brought, brought to our attention when I was growing up. And it's ever since, it's a short, it's a short song, it's just a, a short chorus, but ever since... Um, whenever I start feeling, you know, really stressed, um, it, it, when I sing this, it, it just brings some of the Lord's peace to my heart. I've even started singing this as a lullaby to my kids sometimes when I'm putting them down because it, uh, putting them down to bed because it just, it's based upon First uh, Peter where it says, "Cast all your cares upon Him, for He cares for you." Um, and it's a short, like I said, short song, but I'd like us to start singing it eventually in service sometimes because it just. I don't know. It's one of those songs that just brings the Lord's peace like few others can. So. I cast all my cares upon you. I lay all of my burdens down at your feet. And any time I don't know what to do, I will cast all my cares upon you. Amen. I cast all my cares upon you. I lay all of my burdens down at your feet. And any time I don't know what to do, I will cast all my cares upon you. Thank you. Amen. What a beautiful melody. That word, melody, just keeps popping up in my head. One of my favorite songs is, There's within my heart a melody, Jesus whispers sweet and low, Care not I am with thee, peace be still, In all of life's ebb and flow. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Fills every life. Come on. Keeps me singing as I go. There we go. I love that song. Put that one on the on the rotation, brother. I know the lyrics of that one. My favorite line is, soon he's coming back to welcome me, far beyond the starry skies, 
I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown. I shall reign with him on high. There we go. We'll, we'll get the rest of that next week. All right, we're, we're going to get out of the book of uh, Jude for a little bit. We're going to go back, trust me. But Jude led me to Nehemiah. Who here was here for the first time I preached on Nehemiah? We're climbing back up on that wall. I'm going to give you a back. If you'll turn with me to Nehemiah, the fourth chapter. If you can't find Nehemiah, go to the very front of your Bible, like your pastor had to a couple of times when he's studying, <laughs> and look for Nehemiah. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, or Esther, Nehemiah, Ezra. One of them. I'd have to go back and look again. It's after First and Second Chronicles, back to the beginning of the Old Testament. I want to tell you a little bit about Nehemiah, just to give you some backstory about this whole situation about the wall. Nehemiah was a man that, in a much turning of things, first of all, hmm, I got a ring in my ear. Anybody else hear that? Must be just my ear. Uh, Nehemiah was not a priest. Nehemiah was not a prophet. Nehemiah wasn't even a king. Nehemiah was what they called was a courtesan. He worked in the king's court for uh, uh, the, I think he was a Sumerian king named Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes was a, uh, captain, a, a captive type uh, king of, of the Sumerians, and they're the ones that put the Babylonians under, under rule and under bondage. But uh, Nehemiah worked in his court, but still kept up with his roots as a as a as a, a uh, as a Hebrew child, and he kept the same traditions, and he kept his heart turned towards God and the and the beliefs and the structure and the and the teachings of of, of Moses. So he stayed true to the to the word of God, and through the years uh, that have gone on, Artaxerxes has allowed the people of. Of, uh, of the children of Israel to actually go back to Jerusalem and start putting Jerusalem back together. And they had been doing that for about a hundred years. From Artaxerxes' predecessor all the way through to him, they allowed some of the Jews to go back into Israel and rebuild. Well, over a hundred years, it had really just gone south. A bunch of money had been dumped into their Stop me if you don't think this sounds like what's happened in some places today with churches. Am I not turned on? All right, we're good. So we see money being put in. We see people being sent. But Nehemiah stops a couple of people that he knew had just come from Jerusalem back up to where he was at in captivity and asked him, what's going on in Jerusalem? I haven't heard anything in a while. And he said, Nehemiah, it ain't good. He's like, what do you mean it ain't been good? It's been 100 years. God told us to go back and put it back together. He gave us the time, the opportunity. Even, even our captors have put money into rebuilding everything. Well, it ain't good. Well, what ain't good about it? It's corrupt. It's like cutting down that, that perfect tree that you want to use for firewood or you want to use for decorations only when you get your chainsaw about halfway through it it just goes through it like a roll of toilet paper it's rotted on the inside the outside looks good it looks like what it ought to look like but then you get into the structure what holds it together that tree just rotted from the inside and that's what he's found out has gone on in Jerusalem all that money and effort that's been put into Jerusalem has gone for naught and it broke Nehemiah's heart like I said, he wasn't a king, a priest, or, or had nothing to do with the, the, the workforce that went. But he yearned to see it done the way God wanted it done. We've got some people in this church today that are that way. That stayed around and are still here to help rebuild and had a burning desire to do what God wanted done here. And I'm going to use this building and this church and these people here in this story with Nehemiah. Because this story here is so relevant today and not just this church here at the corner of Dahl and, and uh, Poplar Level Road. But it's true all over the world and where you see churches that after the pandemic went through and after this went through that, well, the best way to handle this, we'll just throw money at it and send people to it. That don't work, does it? 
because if God ain't in it, it ain't going to be right. Anyway, Nehemiah had one response. He had a first response. I'm going to ask you, when God put a desire on your heart to do something, you're going to have a first response. And that first response to what God's calling is on your life, your first response is going to be very crucial. What was, what was Jonah's first response when God told him to go to Nineveh? No, no. no. I'm going to... Tarshish. Do you know what? He had to come back from where he started when he said no. He had to come right back through there and go, I guess he was right. <laughs> I'm headed to Nineveh. But his first response was not that way. How many other people can we see throughout history that God told them to do something a certain way? Look at Paul. Paul was raised up in a Jewish household. Roman too, but he grew up. He said, I am, I am a... Pharisee of Pharisees. He said, I am a follower of the law. And here he was. He was on his way to go persecute another church. And what did God do to him? Stopped him right there and asked him, Why persecutest thou me? Paul thought he was doing the work of God, but he wasn't. He was doing his own work. But his first response was off. But Nehemiah, Nehemiah's first response was he wept for Jerusalem. When God calls us to do something, most usually when our heart breaks and we move to do what God calls us to do, it's out of weeping and it's out of, out of heartbreak that we want to do something. How many of us have sat here and watched at the end of a program right before the final scene of a, of a TV show or a movie you're fixing to watch on TV? This commercial comes on and first thing they show you is these poor old dogs in cages. <laughs> well, hey, I can't change the channel. <laughs> my, my show's fixing to finish up and, and uh, Barney, Barney Miller's fixing to nail this guy. <laughs> or, uh, or somebody's fixing to figure, Matlock's fixing to show me how it's all solved. So I can't change the channel. They pull at your heartstrings. I'm going to ask you, when, when you see wrong in the house of the Lord, does it break our heart? Or do we try to hide it? Do we pick up a rug and... I'm going to tell you something, just to tell you how much that's true. There's a floor back here. Some of you probably ain't been back here. There's a hot water tank back here. It sits on a floor that's about to fall in. I weigh 200 and... 40 pounds <laughs> and I'm scared to walk on it but the men and the women in this church believe that is a representation of how we do God's work let's fix that floor make it solid then we can build on it Amen. Nehemiah had that yearning too to see it fixed so Nehemiah puts it together quickly a group of people and says, i got to go. Artaxerxes says, tell me what you need. Here's some money. By the way, here's governorship for you to take care of whatever you need to tell them people to get busy. By the way, Jerusalem was under Artaxerxes' rule at the time. In fact, all them little governors around that area fell under Artaxerxes. To give you a little truth. I'm giving you some backstory. We're going to read here in a minute. That's, I'm going to encourage you. I don't want, I have a lot of stuff up there, but I want you to read through as we get ready to go. I want you to see how this all panned out. Because there was a man willing to do what God wanted done. And he knew it was going to be a fight. But he knew. And I want you to read before we start there. I want you to skip down to the 20th verse. And this is kind of like a sub reason and what this is about. Nehemiah 4 verse 20 says, In what place therefore we hear the sound of the trumpet, resort ye therefore thither unto us, our God shall fight for us. It ain't our fight. What did Jesus say to Paul on, his way to Damas uh, on the road to Damascus? Why persecutest thou me? This fight ain't our fight. God's got the fight. He fights for us. We just need to suit up and do our time at the watch. 
He told us to watch and pray. He gave us armor in case we had to attack or defend. Because we're to defend one another in the faith. Yeah, amen. Defend one another in the faith. Defend the faith. Fight for the faith. But we have a God that will fight for us. We just need to show up for battle. So many times we're caught in the mess hall when the battle's going on. I'll suck the head on bed. That's too long in the mess hall. If y'all don't want a mess hall, it's the cafeteria in the army. So here's Nehemiah. He's going back to Jerusalem. He's going to go fix some things. When he gets down there, he's going to find out there's going to be a problem. He's going to find out there is an enemy on the outside trying to get in. That's why they don't want a wall or they don't want fences or gates. But the worst thing he's going to find out, he's got people on the inside not wanting it built either. Why? Let's find out. Nehemiah 4, verse 1. I do not have my glasses on, so pardon me if I have to duck and dodge around this text. But it came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. Who's Sanballat? Sanballat is the Sumerian, and he's on an edge of the northern edge of Jerusalem, on the northern edge of Israel, and he sits just north of there, and he's got a lot invested in all that money that they have... Uh, Artaxerxes has dumped in Jerusalem. Sanballat has imposed taxes. He's imposed tariffs. He's done a lot of trade to get that money that was sent in there to fix things. He's got devices used. That's why he don't want a wall there or something that's going to restrict him from taking that money out of there. So Sanballat is wrought with them wanting to come down there and put a wall up. That's Nehemiah's first outside problem. He was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. How many of us here have ever gone out to do something and we bow to pray or we get ready to do something or we say, well, may God bless you or say something in a Christian motive to say something to somebody to help support or help lift somebody up only to hear somebody mock that? Who's not heard that? I can tell you within the last week, I've heard it two or three times. We're going to get mocked. We're going to be caught into those situations where people are going to laugh at us for our belief, for our stance, for wanting to build a wall up. How many of us here have seen these school board meetings where the parents have stopped, stood up and stood for their children and said, you're not teaching that to my kid. They're wanting to put that wall back up only to hear what? Our government speak against them. Keep the faith. Keep putting that wall up. We're going to get mocked. We're going to get laughed at. But we're not to raise our voice against it we're, or our tongue against them or to speak ill of them. Much like we're not to sit there and challenge the devil at every turn to say, Satan, come at me because I got somebody behind me that's bigger than you are. And what it does, it sounds like you're having a conversation with the devil and you're praying to him. Stop that. He ain't scared of you in the least. How do I know that? Because I'll tell you what, Satan walked right into the throne room of God and challenged him about Job. Do you think he's worried about you? He knows scripture better than you. He knows the hymnals better than we do. Don't go throwing your weight around against Satan. Even, even the archangel Michael said, let God rebuke you and walked away from him. Because it doesn't say fight the devil and he shall flee. What's it say? Resist him. Just resist him. Even Jesus, Jesus used just scripture against him, didn't get in a lengthy conversation and rebuke him. He used the word. So resist the devil and he'll flee. Don't fight those battles. Don't go to arguing with somebody about scripture. All they want to do is make a mockery of you. Don't start arguing scripture with them. Use the scripture, make your point, move on. Don't make a fight out of it. All they want to do, any, any of y'all ever been in a uh, pig wrestling? 
or you got to catch a grease pig contest. Anybody ever done that? I know you're from Nebraska. You're giggling. You've been in them. You were in FFA, weren't you? No? Oh. Don't ever wrestle a pig in a mud hole. Two things are going to happen. You're going to get muddy and the pig's going to have fun. That's all that's going to happen. Don't argue with Satan. Don't fight with people over Scripture that are unbelievers. Don't argue with them over Scripture. Show them the Scripture. Pray for them. Sow the seed. Let somebody else water it. Walk on. That's all. I won't even charge you. That was out of text. Ephesians 6 says, put on the whole armor of God. I'm going to sit here and paraphrase this or else we'll be here all day because I've only got through, what, one verse? <laughs> we got a whole chapter. We may be here a couple weeks. We don't wrestle against flesh and bone. We don't. This fight that you're having with somebody over how to raise kids or how to teach kids or what the world is about, about transgender this and homosexuality that and, and plural marriage this and that, don't argue them. You're, you're in a fool's argument, as it says. They're just going to make you look like a fool. They don't care if they already are one. They know. My wife will tell you, what's my, fa my worst pet peeve? <laughs> Defending a stupid position. Somebody knows they're wrong, but they'll just argue with it because they, that was their decision. Uh, that's the way I believe. Well, why? Because well, I believe that way. They'll defend a stupid position. That's, I don't like that. And that's what people will do that are out of Scripture, that are out of Christ. They'll just make you look bad. Know your Bible. Know your Bible. Let's go to verse 2. And he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews, will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end, of, in a, make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps, the rubbish which are burned? Hmm. He's mocking them. It's going to hurt my heart here, but I'm going to say it. There were certain people that found out we were going to keep church going here. I heard from more than one person, what they need to do is just go ahead and shut the doors and sell that property and get the money they can get out of it. Your pastor about lost it. Made me angry. It hurt. I love my church. And it has nothing to do with the building sitting on the corner of this lot. I love my church. And when they said, made a mockery out of it and said, just shut the doors. Tell them to go find someplace else to worship. I wept. I wept. When people make a mockery of your faith, does it hurt you? Does it hurt? Or do you giggle thinking, yeah, they got a point. If that's your point, then we'll pray that's all he wanted to do was make a mockery out of it so what are they going to do so what do we got to do the next verse is going to tell you that did not come from outside that statement came from those that were inside don't let them in this goes this is how I ended up from Jude to Nehemiah it says, be wary, they have crept in unawares. Was that not in Jude in verse 4, I believe? They've crept in unawares. I may be the under-shepherd here, but I'm going to tell you now, I'm one of those sheep dogs. <laughs> if I smell a wolf in my flock, we're going outside. You're not staying inside this fence. You're not staying in a gate. If, you find, if I find yourself, the Holy Spirit reveals that you are a wolf in the sheep's den, then I'm going to take you out. We're not having that in here. False teachers, false prophets, false anything in this church will not be tolerated. Will not. We will have discipline in this church. We will have freedom. We will have the liberty of salvation. We will have the fun that we've had in fellowship. But we're going to have order and we're going to have discipline. 
We're going to do it God's way, not Gary's way. We've tried Gary's way. <laughs> it don't work, does it, Gary? <laughs> but we're going to do it God's way. Nehemiah put his foot down, and I'm going to show you how. Verse four, uh, 3. Now Tobiah the Ammonite was him, and he said, Even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. What he's saying is, anybody ever seen a cat get up on a shelf and start pitching knickknacks off of the shelf? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I like doing that. He's saying that's how they're going to build that wall. That if a fox even climbs on it, it'll, run, it'll fall. Because that's their view of building. That was their view of how churches are. How many of us have seen them preachers get up? We see them on TV every now and go, Whoo, that's a fiery man of God. Boy, that, that guy can preach. He can preach a windstorm up or can preach a, 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 a storm up. We've heard that. Where are they now? Building your house upon the rock or building your house upon the sand? All they know is houses built on sand. A little storm come by and they get pushed over. And that's what they're saying. We're going to build this church, this fellowship of believers, not building, but this fellowship of believers on the rock. On Jesus. We're going to do it by His Word and His Word alone. It's not going to let a fox climb up on a wall and knock it off. But we've got to get that rubble. How many of you ever seen the uh, Mount Rushmore? Any of you ever seen those beautiful faces of the presidents? Below that is called escarpment. Escarpment. That's where all the rock that was hewn out of that, those faces fell to the ground below it and down underneath them faces it's just a big old rock pile. You can't build nothing on that. It's solid rock. You wouldn't want it to land on your car or your toe. I mean, it's rock, but it's rubble. Church, we need to get some of the rubble out too. Some of our beliefs that aren't in line with Scripture, people that are here to just cause turmoil and drama and cause heartache, we don't need that. You got to get the rubble out of the house before you move the furniture in. So we're going to do that. We're going to build it God's way, the right way, like Nehemiah did. Verse 4, hear, O God. Here's his prayer. Here was his prayer. He's, they've revealed themselves, the outside and the inside, where his enemies are going to come from. So he knows and now he's got his armor on. Now he's going to the commander of the relief. He's going to the captain. He's going to his leader. He's going to the commander in chief. He went to God in prayer, what we should do. You didn't hear him speak a word to them, did you? He didn't speak to them, did he? Did he, he didn't have a response to them. Didn't need to. Why? It's not his fight. Verse 20, what did it say? Our God will fight for you. So here's his prayer. Oh, hear, oh, our God, for we are despised and turned their reproach upon their own head and give them for a prey to the land of captivity and cover not their iniquity and let not their sin be blotted out bef from before thee. For they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. Woo. Any of y'all ever have a scab? What's a scab do? Covers a sore or covers an opening, don't it? He's praying basically that that scab come off and re be revealed, that their sin be revealed to you, O God. What's it one, one thing that says not to provoke to anger? Children provoke not your parents to anger or parents don't provoke your children to anger? They have provoked God's children to anger. And Nehemiah is saying, God, they're provoking you to anger. God, don't let their sins be covered up. Please expose their sins that they be seen. That's what we're going to do here. 
bleach. Anytime a house has ever been found, in my neighborhood anyway, if they find a house that, where they've made meth in, they take the walls completely down to the two befores. And they take this bleach mixture and scrub them two befores to clean it before they put that house back together. That's what Nehemiah is doing here. He's exposing everything so it can be scrubbed clean. He wants a new start. Kind of like what we did here, didn't we? A new start. Things got scrubbed down. Start over. All the way to the bones. First of all, we all face battles. We've all got our own battles we face. Each and every one of us. When we get ready to go do something for God, we're all going to face our own battles differently. Why? Because there's different enemies against each one of us. One of my biggest vices is being lazy. No, 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 no. I'll read it later. <laughs> That's one of mine. That's one of the battles I face every day. Get up, go read your lesson, go do this, go pray, get off the TV, go do what you got to do. That's a battle I face. I'll admit that to you in front of everybody. I don't know what your battles are, unless you come and tell me this is one of my battles. But we're each got our own battles to fight. When I was in high school, I, let me back up. When I was in grade school, I was one of the biggest kids in my class, my sister's class. Next class up, I was about their size. I was the kid, everybody went, come and got, hey, so-and-so took my milk, or so-and-so knocked my books off my desk. Where at? I fought battles. That was my role. I knew that. I had a little brother named Charlie. I'm waving at him because he's probably watching. <laughs> if he ever got in trouble, he come and got his big brother. I had cousins that were older than me. If I had problems, I went and got them. Usually that was the fight was my cousins. So. <laughs> but we each have our own battles, and we each want to fight these battles. Some of us are so eager to fight battles, we think that we can whip it all. In fact, we're the ones that usually say... All right, Satan, I got you. Come bring it on. <laughs> no. Know what your battles are. Each of us know what our battles are, what, we, what we're strong in and what we're weak in and what we need help in. But that ain't the point. It's the one to your left and to your right. They've got battles. You need to pray for them. You don't, you don't know how to help, but you can pray for them. Because we all have got battles. We all must fight our own battles. But what's it say? Go right back there to Nehemiah 4.20. God will fight our battles for us. I told you, being a Christian is simple. It's hard, but it's simple. Lift one another up. Pray for one another in these battles. Some of us have addictions that are, that are bothering us. Some of us have have problems in our past that keep haunting us and some of us have family members that, that bring trash into our house and we don't want it there no more and we're trying to clean things up. Some of us have these other issues in our lives and, and that people keep bringing to us and we have to fight these battles daily. Daily. We don't know. But God will fight those battles for you no matter what they are. How big, how small. He wants them all taken. He wants to take on all those battles because I tell you what, if you let that one little thing fester, you say, I can handle that one, God, I got it. I don't think you can handle this yet. Because that's what worry is, is telling God, I don't think you can quite handle this one yet. You're not a big enough God to handle that because you don't know my brother. You don't know my mom. You don't know my sister. You don't know my son. Yeah, he does. Give him that one. That's the one he wants. He wants that battle. He don't want the one that <laughs> it's blowing up in your face. You're like, God, help me. He knew Peter. When Peter said, Lord, help me, I'm drowning. He, he knew Jesus would help him. But what about his other little battles that Peter didn't want to let God handle? Like his sharp tongue, like his temper. He didn't trust them to God very often. He tried to handle those, and they handled him. Give God those little battles. But we all face battles. In this time, we also know that we, we all have a backup. 
Verse 4. Hear, O God, for we are despised, and turn their reproach upon us, their own head, and give them for prey in our land and captivity. Verse 5, And cover not their iniquity, and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee, for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. I think I covered most of this. Satan trembles when he... I told you about it. He's not scared of you, but it says, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. I'm going to make a t-shirt with that on there one day. Or a bumper sticker. I like that one. That's when Satan's going to tremble. That's, that's when this world coming at you will cease to bother you. Is when you take it to the Lord. We all have a backup. We all know we've got, we've got security. Nehemiah did not go to Jerusalem when he left Samaria. He didn't go down there when he knew he was on his own. He knew he had backup. Two things. He had backup in the sense that King Artaxerxes wrote him a piece of paper and said, Here, you're the governor of that place. Your call goes. You have my blessing, whatever you want to do. He knew he had that behind him. But he knew he had something even better. He had a God that put those stones in place the first time. Christian, you have a God that saved you that's still in that business today. He's still about saving. He's still about healing. He's still about helping the hurt. He's still about healing everything. He's still that God. You've got a backup. Third point. We all bring a balance. I'm going to skip down to verse 16. Let's get moving here a little bit. Let me go back to 13 a moment. Therefore set I in the lower places behind the wall, and on the higher places I even set the people after their families, and with their sword, with their spears and their bows. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord which is great and terrible and fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters and your wives and your houses. <laughs> Don't worry. He's got us armed. He armed us. I was going to wear a tool belt in here today. I thought about going out in the garage and getting my tool belt. And I really thought about this for a moment. You had to follow me here for my train of thought. You're going to find out Nehemiah tells about a trial in one hand and a sword in another. thought about putting my Tim the tool belt on and having my trial in one, because i got a trial, spread mud mortar for laying brick putting my tape measure in and all my stuff on this side here and over here I ain't going to do it but put my sword in this pouch my Bible study stuff in there and, and that's how he was equipped Christian I may be wrapping up here I don't even know what time it is but I want to get down to the brass tacks of this for a moment we're each called to this battle I, when I got saved, I was just looking for, I was just looking for repentance and, and cleaning my life up. I was just looking for a, a new place to call home. I was, I was just looking for a clean heart. I wasn't into this battle stuff and this warrior stuff and fighting and wars and battle. I, I wasn't ready for that. Well, get on board because you ain't fighting alone. How many of us ever played army men? Women. Army women. Okay. You ever play by yourself? Boring. <laughs> boring. Never played army men by myself. That was boring. If I get two or three friends together to play army men, it was a lot of fun. I didn't join. When I joined the army in 1984, I went in with a bunch of guys. It wasn't by myself. I couldn't imagine going through basic training with four drill sergeants and me. I don't know if they could have handled that. We're here to fight together. 
to your left and to your right. He set them in their place. Nehemiah put them in their place where they needed to be. He put some people he knew that were good at this here. People were good at this here. And how do you think a church is built? We got a women's Sunday school teacher. We got a men's Sunday school teacher. We got a children's Sunday school teacher. We got somebody who wants to lead in music. We got somebody who wants to take care of this. We got some people who help to take care of that. Why? Because that's where God set the stones the first time by his right. And Nehemiah came along and said, okay, God, show me where these people need to go. And he put them where they needed to be so they could watch over one another. Wow, here we go back to the feathers again, ain't it? Lifted one another up. And that's why we're here to fight, not alone. Sister, did you go up there and ask for prayer by yourself? No. Oh, we all came together to pray for her. And that's what church is. That's what they're rebuilding is the tabernacle or the temple. They got to put a wall up to keep them that are out from coming in and them that are in doing wrong to kick them over the hill. I'll tell you why, if you find yourself to be on the outside of this church, come in through the narrow gate. That's another sermon altogether, ain't it, sister? <laughs> but you're not fighting alone and you're not unequipped. You're not by yourself because you're important in who you are. God's got a calling for you and you and you and you. Everybody in here has a calling on their life that benefits this house, that benefits this temple. And I'm not talking a building. I'm not talking the square footage of a, of a plot of land. I'm talking about the church and those that have been set aside that have been called out to do something. Each and every one of us got something in us to do. And he's got you here. I'm going to hand you a trial of one hand, probably put a sword in your other hand and get, tell you, get ready. You don't have to fight or build because you're not just going to warm a bench. I'm like Calipari. I may call on that 12th man down there sometime. Get in. You're next. I just shoot free throws. <laughs> Not today. Your point guard. He's given us all a role, given us some purpose here. Let me ask you this. Why do you think God didn't just take you on to heaven once you got saved? If that's your idea of it, well, I'm just come here to keep this place warm. Hold this chair down. <laughs> if you come here just to hold the chair down, mm, I hope you can get up you got work to do we've all got work to do we've all been called according to his purpose in heaven we all have well, that's all that, that ain't just a few we've all been called for something find out what that something is and make it known how else can I pray for you if you don't if we don't know what you need or maybe you don't know yet but you want to be told you want God to reveal it to you well, all I can do is pray. Hallelujah. You know how many people I would take walking that door right now and say, I just come here to be a prayer warrior for you, brother. Well, come on, I got room for you. We need warriors like that. Am I right? Am I right? Yeah. I'll take a few prayer warriors any day on the front line. Absolutely. We call them riflemen in the infantry. <laughs> Ain't we? We're, we're ready for that. You've got a purpose. You're, you're here for some reason. We've all got that. We all bring balance. We all need boldness. We all need boldness. Verse 19. And I said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, the work is great and large, and we are separated upon the wall, one far from another. It's going to get wild. I was so used to when I was in the military. I was trained in, in, in either jungle environment or I was trained in woodland environment of Germany. We are always told the Russians are coming through the Fulda Gap and we got to get ready to fight in the woods. Or the jungles of this or that when we go to South America or whatever. I was trained in that. My first war engagement... <laughs> Was in, the, was in the desert. <laughs> and there ain't no place to hide in the desert, sister. 
You can only hide behind a sand dune till the wind blows. And then that sand dune ends up behind you and you're exposed. Happened. A whole big 26 ton track got moved. That or the sand moved, one of the two. I'm not sure yet, but we got moved. There's a, it's going to be dangerous. We're going to be up on that wall. We're going to be up there fighting and we're going to be up there trying to get work done and arrows are going to start coming in. I need somebody to my right and to my left to hold a shield up while I'm still putting brick into place. See how that works? I need to hold a shield for a while so somebody can teach little children about the love of Jesus. I need some warrior on their knees right here praying over somebody whose family members got alcohol problems or got a drug problems. I need somebody to stand over them, hold a shield over them of protection and prayer while I'm down here ministering or while somebody else is ministering to them or we're trying to get the floor brought back up in back here in the water tank room. I need people to pray. Lord, our finances are getting low. Please, we need a shower of your blessing. Well, that's what we need. People that have a place on the wall that are bold. I'll take it. I'll take that role. Who wants first watch? I'll take that one. I'll take boldness any day. Well, I'll be in the mess hall if you need me. <clears throat> I don't need them. We don't need them in the church. We've had them for years. What did it get him? A hundred years of money and people being poured into Jerusalem that did no good only to find people mocking them for trying to come down and put the walls up. Trying to make something right. Church, we're going to run into opposition. I'm going to give you a fair warning right now. We're going to run into problems that are going to come before us that we're going to think are too great for us to handle. And you know what? You're right. They're going to be too great for us to handle. I'm going to wrap it up here. Verse 20. In what place, therefore, we hear the sound of the trumpet, resort to thither unto us. Our God shall fight for us. Because here's what I'll take. A child of God doing the work of God in the will of God is invincible. Is invincible. A child of God doing the work of God is in the will of God is invincible. You think I'm crazy? No. You ain't going to die until God's done with you. You're invincible. You stay within the will of God, doing the work of God for God, and you're going to be here for a while until God's done with you. I asked Brother Varney one time. Brother Varney, this is back when he was a young man at 77, 78. <laughs> oh, you think I'm kidding? He was a young man at 77. He was just getting started, I think. I asked him, when are you going to retire? He said, what do you mean, retire? <laughs> Pastors don't retire. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I may have to rethink this job. <laughs> he said, I'll preach until God's done with me. I'll pray until God's done with me. I'll serve in Sunday school class until God's done with me. I'll lead singing until God's done with me. I'll pray for these kids until God's done with me. I'll pray for my husband until God's done with me. I'll pray for my wife until God's done with me. I'm going to preach God's word and I'm going to stand for God, do God's work in God's will till he's done with me. And then when I go home, I win. Peter or Paul said, to live is Christ, to die is gain. I gain. I get that longing fulfilled. I get to come off that wall. And you know what? He's got somebody right behind me to step in. Elisha followed right out behind Elijah. Elisha from Elijah. God had somebody right there. When David was gone, he had somebody step right in and keep moving the word of God forward. But you're invincible till God's done with you. He's going to fight for you. And you've got somebody to your left and to your right. So what are you worried about? What is there to worry about? You've got a God that set the cornerstone of this earth 
by his thought, by his speaking it into existence, still fighting for you today. That same God that called forth of a, ten a thousands of angels could have been called at any time that Jesus wanted to from the cross. But Jesus still did his mission, what he would called to do, what he gave his life to do. That same God is there today, still today, and tomorrow and the day after. Still invincible. Right now, I'm immortal. I'm invincible. I ain't died yet, have I? Neither of you. You're invincible as long as you're doing the will of God until he calls you, calls you home. Now, if we're going to ache and hurt and suffer, you guys ever done any kind of work like rebuilding a wall? Anybody ever done that? I haven't, but I can imagine that hurts. End of the day, I can guarantee it's more than just sore fingers and, and uh, corporal tunnel. <laughs> I'm sure it's a lot worse. But God took care of them. Come back and we'll show you what happens when people that stay together, what happens in 41 days. Nobody heard that, did they? 41 days. Is that right? 41 days. Later, we're going to finish this up. But you have a God fighting for you. Let us stand. Let us see if I can find him. Revelations 11. You don't have to turn there. These are the two witnesses that come back. We're, we're past the opening of the seals and tribulations going on and two witnesses come back. These have power to shut the heavens. This is the power God gives these two witnesses when they come back. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in days of their prophecy and have the power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all the plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. When they have finished their testimony. These are the two witnesses that walked home with God and never seen death, as the, as the Bible says. But they're not going to die through all that tribulation time until they're done with their testimony. You're not done until your testimony's over. That's God. So what do you got to be scared of? This world, which can only take your temporal stuff? Your earthly possessions, it'll burn up like wood, hay, and stubble. Pfft, it'll be gone. I'm going to tell one quick story real quick. I told Tammy this one the other day. There was a local fisherman at this small island village. An American was, tourist was down there with him. They were fishing off, his por off this port or this uh, uh, dock. That local fisherman caught a fish, nice big old fish, and he said, ah, oh, good. First cast, big fish. He said, that'll feed my family. I'm good. I'm gone. The American said, where are you going? He said, caught what I needed. Where are you going at then? And I said, feed my family. So later after we're done eating, have a good meal, go sit at the beach and watch the sunset and play some music and, and uh, drink a little bit of, of iced tea and sit back and relax and watch the sunset. He said, oh, no, 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 no. You need to catch a few more of these fish and settle them down there at the market and make you 25, 30 bucks. And, man, you do that a few more days, you can buy you a big fishing boat and, you know, and sell your fish and make thousands and thousands of dollars a day and then buy a bigger boat, get a big fleet, make you a big corporation. He said, how long is this going to take me to make these millions? And he said, well, wait a minute. And then you could sell it, make your billions, and, and then all that. He said, well, how long is it going to take me to do this? He said, oh, about 20, 25 years. Hmm. Then what do I do? He said, well, you sell it for billions, and you can buy any kind of car you want, any place you want to live. And he said, okay. 
And then what? And then you can come and sit on the beach and sit and watch the sunset <laughs> with iced tea with your friends. He's like, I'll just do it this way. <laughs> that is to point you out that God's got a place for you to be. Got a, a path he wants you on to do it in. Don't complicate it. Don't put more into it than, there's, than it's there. Just follow God's will. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we come to you now with your word. We thank you again that this word is written in our ears, is now written in our hearts, Lord, that we'll be able to use what you've showed us to help others and not just ourselves. Lord, but to help build this wall. Lord, as you showed us your word, it strengthens us and gives us encouragement. But Lord, it warns us also. We thank you not only for the encouragement, but for the warning. And that we know what to look for. And as you shine the light of our path, Lord, we see those things which can trouble us, that we can avoid. Lord, and thank you for showing us how to resist the devil so that he'll flee. Lord, we thank you so much for including us in your plan, Lord. We know so easily you could have just not even had us around or done without us. But Lord, you chose us. You set us aside and called us out to be your children. Lord, I pray as we rebuild this church, Lord, that it be rebuilt upon solid ground. Lord, that we do those things that are pleasing to your sight, not to this world. Lord, I pray that as we do those things, Lord, as the fiery darts are fired, dear Lord, I pray that my brother and sister to my left and to my right are true to their, their calling. Dear God, if there be somebody here today that says, God, I don't even know what that man's talking about. But I know that my life needs direction. And I know that my life needs change. Lord, I pray that you'll touch this heart. That they'll find repentance. And find their path to you. Lord, I pray that if they be lost in the wilderness, Lord, that they see that the error of their ways needs to stop and turn and go back to you. Lord, I pray if there be somebody in my family that has turned from you, dear God, that you'll give me the courage to be the, that light that you've called me to be. Lord, I pray whatever you've called me to be, Lord, I pray that it, I have the, the courage to seek you out for it, Lord, how to do it. Lord, I pray that you'll give me the courage to stand firm on your word. Lord, lift us up now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I thank you for your time. If anybody wants to come and pray, Brother Jim, could you give us a few course lines of invitation? If anybody wants to come and pray, anybody here wants to make a decision, or if anybody here wants to join the church, now's the time. I appreciate everybody that's come forward and said, let me do this. God's called me to do this. God wants me to do that. You can all be seated for a moment. I just want you to be in a prayer for mind. You can all be seated. But I don't want anybody to walk out this church today saying, I just don't know where God wants me to do. If you'll ask, he'll show you. But I'm going to be honest with you, it may be a struggle. Because God may send you to Nineveh and you may not want to go there. But he's going to have somebody go to Nineveh, isn't he, brother? He's going to have somebody going to spread the word to the Macedonians. Who's heard that song, heard the Macedonian call today? I'm glad that Paul heard that Macedonian call to spread the word and the gospel to Europe and out that way so we could hear it. But that wasn't where he wanted to go. He was on his way to Damascus to persecute the church. But he decided to follow after God's heart. Anybody here today want to follow after God's heart? It doesn't know where that path may go. It may, it may head you back down to Danville, Kentucky. It may, it may put you on Dahl Street in Louisville. It may be just the next pew over to go pray for somebody. Just say, send me. Send me.
If anybody wants to, come. Thank you again. Let's not forget our tithes and offering and back here in the box. Uh, coat drive, the box is back here. If you've got coats to give and you want to come up through the week and drop them off, you forgot it and you're on your way and you got them in a the car or something like that, give one of us a call. Are you close enough if somebody needs to drop them off or something? If not, bundle them up. Be here Friday. Friday, 630. Yes, sir. Let me finish up real quick, and uh, let's not forget Friday night, 6.30. We've got a business meeting coming up. No, not a business meeting. Let's not forget conference Saturday the 12th, right? August 12th. August. November 12th. Woo. Well, I'm glad she ain't the pastor right now. So, let's not forget. Brother Rick. Oh, he's coming up here. Yeah. Oh, he's going to work both of us. You know, we have, uh, this month, October, is Pastor Appreciation Month, okay? And, Brother Gary, I don't know what to say. What, what you've done for us and, and through God the last year or so it just means so much to me and everybody else. Before you leave today, come hug their neck and let them know what they mean to you in the church. Oh, thank you. Thank you, brother. Love you. <laughs> Anybody have anything else? If not, come on up here and get a hug. <laughs>